welcome back to the channel today we're back with game of thrones history and lore it's the it's the final one man i don't know if there's gonna be two parts or one parts but whatever it is this is the final recording for me i mean i, j I just did the uh, other one right before this but it's the fin final time we're sitting down with it man first time final it final first time i'm saying because I'm getting a reaction. Like, I can always come back and watch it again. You get what I'm saying? But uh, I'm ready to jump into this. But before you do, make sure you thumbs up and subscribe. And let's get it. King's Landing is both a city and a curse. Aegon the Conqueror was the first king to land there. His first conquest to tie nearly to the mouth of the Blackwater River, where he raised a wooden fort. When it became clear that Aegon would earn his title, People flocked to the fort and read And this one HD and shit. The ploy succeeded. And Aegon chose King's Landing for his capital over old and more beautiful cities like Old Town and anywhere else. The currying of royal favor thus became the foundation of the city, and blood its bricks. Magor the Cruel, Aegon's son, completed the city's famous red keep to hold the trappings of power. The royal family, the king's guard, and the Iron Throne. To maintain the new castle's secrets, Magar murdered all its masons and craftsmen at a feast, which he catered to the new castle servants, who soon found all its secrets for themselves. When the Faith Militant challenged his rule, Magor raised their sept of remembrance to the ground with them inside at prayer and erected the dragon pit on the ashes. But the great dragons it housed were attacked by the very low-born people they were meant to terrify. Thousands of people died in the attempt, but hundreds of thousands lived in King's Landing. And now the only dragons in the city are golden. Like most kings, Aegon and Magor missed a single truth. That a king lands is less important than what he lands on. The people, who will never visit his red keep or his dragon pit, or any of his noble monuments to nobility, because they're too busy holding up his realm. Without the slums of Flea Bottom and the poor and desperate folk it produces, who would fight the King's Wars and cook the King's meals and admire him as he rode past at speed? Without its winding dark alleys and pot shops, where would the Red Keep empty its sewage? Of all kinds. Without the Street of Flour, the King would have no bread. Without the Street of Steel, the King's armies would have no swords, armor, or victories. Without the Street of Looms, the King would go naked. And without the Street of Silk, he wouldn't enjoy it. Without the Street of Sisters, the King would have no humility. It leads from the ruin of the Dragon Pit to the ruin of the Great Sept of Baelor, where the Targaryens and Baratheons buried their kings. Until Cersei Lannister unburied. Yeah. Now those kings are ashes, scattered on the wind. Nobody marked where they landed. No one even gave a shit at that point. They're like, oh yeah, she's queen. A realm without people is scenery. It should not be hard to recruit lords into a war against an enemy known as the Mad King. We can even understand the lords who chose to Jeez. Their and fight for they they really went crazy with this artwork. I think this is this is actual animation now. Second best. He would have set out the whole war if not for my brother and me. We convinced him that nobody would fear the walls of the sea if we curled up by our fires while others feasted on the spoils of the Mad King. So the old man creaked into his rusty armor and set sail for the reach, only to be routed by Tyrell Longbow. When my father sadly fell in battle, my older brother Balin beat a tactical retreat to his own inheritance as the new lord of the Iron Islands. I'd rather die in the reach than live on the Iron Islands. <laughs> the roses are prettier to pluck, but my brother was getting old and felt that longing to sleep. The sea stone chair was as good a place as any. Within a few years, he realized that sitting is only fun if everyone else has to stand. He had the priest reforge. No, that's not right. 
They picked up sticks on the beach, wove them into a new ancient driftwood crown, and declared Balaam the king of the Iron Islands. Unfortunately for my brother, the other king in Westeros, Robert Baratheon, was famously bad at sharing, and his father... Jeez, they went crazy for this final one, dude. Yes, you were very clever, and how brave, burning our ships at anchor in the night. <laughs> they would have burned the same in daylight. Vines are lazy beasts. You didn't rouse them so long after I set fire to a proud mane. I planned it all, you know. My first torch took your father's flagship. If it makes you feel better, we didn't loot it. Out of respect. And time. I don't think I ever saw Robert happier than the day he heard about the Greyjoy Rebellion. He'd been king for a handful of years, and many handfuls of other things. And it was clear to him and everyone else how ill-suited he was to rule. But battle he could do. Unfortunately, by the time we raised our army, we seemed to be winning the war. Balon's eldest son, your nephew, died trying to storm Seaguard, and his men were thrown back into the arms of their drowned god. If we wanted battle, we'd have to hurry north before the Ironborn put down their own rebellion. And we would have, if I've had my way. Rebelling was a stupid idea. Never stopped your people before. Before Balan put those sticks on his head, I told him that if you wanted to rule the Iron Islands, all he had to do was give King Robert a tour of them. Why waste our forces fighting a war we couldn't win for a place our enemy wouldn't want? With the Iron Fleet, we could reef not just Westeros, but the rich lands beyond the Sunset Sea. But my brother was too attached to that sea stone chair. He commanded me to sail the Iron Fleet against Robert's navy before we could ferry his army to Pike. A navy commanded by Robert's younger brother, Stannis, most known for sitting in a besieged castle eating dogs and horses. Remind me, how did you fare against a man who'd never commanded ships in battle? Yeah, it's a well. Stannis <laughs> smashed your iron fleet at Fair Isle. After I sailed it into a strait where our numbers and the size of our ships would work against us, it took some doing to convince my men to rush into such an obvious trap. Stannis was not a subtle man. You would rather claim treason than defeat. Victory would have only delayed it. We mm. couldn't hold on to Robert's forces forever, but we could waste enough ironborn that we wouldn't even fill our own islands after the war. I made sure the silence escaped. That was enough for me. That and watching your army smash my brother's castle soon afterwards. Why didn't you just abandon him after Fair Isle? Why risk your precious life fighting for him at Pike? I want to kill the best knights in Westeros. You failed. So did you. I expected pursuit when I fled by them in silence. But I suppose you were too busy not punishing my brother to not punish the man who burned your father's fleet. And now, I'm back. You were back. But what is the king of the Iron Islands when he's off the Iron Islands? I'll never see those shit stained rocks again. But I'm getting old. And I find myself wanting to sit down. As my father and brother did in their time. They just chose the wrong chair. Aegon, fourth of his name, is remembered by history as the unworthy. Quite a few considering the other kings of Westeros. But even in a family of and equanimity, Aegon stands out for spiteful incompetence. He tore apart the realm simply because he couldn't rule himself, much less Westeros. As a young prince, Aegon's wit made him beloved at court and won him forgiveness for youthful indiscretions. But the cold steel of the Iron Throne didn't temper his passions. King Aegon proclaimed that if he had to spend his days being pricked by a thousand swords, he'd spend his nights pricking others with his one. Lords sent their daughters from court so they would not catch the king's eye. Whilst other lords summoned the daughters to court, so they would. 
The only woman in whom he took no pleasure was his sister and wife, Nares. Even after she gave him a son and a day wrong. That's that's normal to y'all, I guess. My bad. Love for his brother, the legendary hero, Prince Aemon, the Dragon Knight. Aegon was most certainly jealous of him. Not of his bravery or honor, but how young maidens swooned and old whores cried at the songs about him. But most likely, Aegon disregarded his wife and son because he chafed at restraints of any kind. Be they the bonds of marriage, or patrimony, or even reason. When Prince Daeron objected to his father's foolish plan to invade Dawn, Aegon incited a lickspittle lord to accuse the queen of adultery with Aemon, making Daeron illegitimate. Prince Aemon defended the queen's honor in trial by combat. But while the lord's claim publicly died with him, no sword can kill a rumor. Out of spite and pique, Aegon had seeded doubt into his own heir's claim to the throne, which bore bitter fruit with the birth of another son, the bastard Daemon Waters by the king's own cousin. Raised in the Red Keep on account of his mother's royal blood, Daemon grew tall and powerful and excelled at all the martial skills that men wrongly value in leaders. Instead of protecting his own heir from a rival, Aegon knighted Dame on the twelve and shot the realm by bestowing on him the Conqueror's own Valyrian steel sword. He even let the boy renounce his common bastard's name and take the Targaryen sword's name for his own, becoming a Daemon Blackfire. Still, though a name can change, blood can't. And Daeron was Aegon's only true-born son. Uh, until he wasn't. On his deathbed, Aegon forever earned his epithet by legitimizing all his bastards. From the base-born sons of whores to the great bastards of noble ladies, including Daemon. Fittingly, Aegon's last act was to thrust himself into the realm and seed chaos. A Targaryen without self-restraint may have led Westeros to the had to say it like that, dude. But the Highborn pushed it over. Though Daeron governed justly and wisely, correcting the worst excesses of his father's rule, many lords had grown rich off these excesses and did not approve of Daeron's reforms, particularly the peace he struck with Dawn. The malcontents rallied to Daemon and whispered that he should be king instead of his brother, whom, thanks to Aegon, many suspected was a bastard. At first, Daemon indulged these lords out of courtesy and vanity. But over time, their grievances and flattery wore down his objections, along with any sense of obligation to the half-brother who had granted him lands and a wife. Daemon agreed to claim the throne by right of birth, and more importantly, arms. A wheel with two hubs will not turn, and a kingdom with two kings will burn, as the saying goes. Not that such a cost ever stopped anyone with even the remotest claim and opportunity, much less House Blackfire. Their rebellions consumed tens of years and thousands of lives. First Daemon's own, then his son, Daemon II, who reigned for a night. Then another son, Hagon, crowned by Bittersteel, another legitimized great bastard who had founded the Golden Company to support the Blackfire claim. When Hagon was executed, Bittersteel crowned Hagon's eldest son, Daemon III, who in turn was slain by their Lord Commander of the King's Guard, Sir Duncan the Tall. Finally, Maelys the oh, this is... fell to Sir Barristan Selmy in the War of the Nine Many Kings. And this is what the hell are. rebellion ended with the extinction of the entire line, as is appropriate. Fire is only black when it is burnt to ash. Perhaps that was the true problem with the Targaryens. The blood of the dragon runs hot and fire consumes. Perhaps what Westeros needs is a ruler born not from fire, but from snow. <coughs> all the even even in your history and lore, all this all this setup just to brought up It's not even over yet.
Huddled around our fires, we told tales of how the sun has lived. How their stone houses touched clouds and their bellies touched the ground. How their women fainted at a sign of blood and wouldn't knife a man even when he slept. I how literally just posted that video when I, when Egress and John were having that conversation. But now we've seen the real South, and we have to admit, we're disappointed. Southerners live life bent over. In the fields, in courts, in bed. They drink too little beer and they eat too many plants. In the north, a man's worth is in his hands and his stories, not his fancy name and fancy talk. With good steel, a man can hunt, kill and live. What can a man do with gold except shine? But what should I expect from a people who all want to sit on the iron chair? A waste of good metal. You can make better seats. I've used them. How am I supposed to get comfortable on a bunch of swords? Facts. Ah, now I see why all your queens are fighting over it. Maybe your southern asses are soft enough to take it. But give me a proper seat any day. Or a proper southern ass. As long as it isn't in the south. From what I hear, King's Landing is even hotter and madder than Winterfell. Full of oath breakers, rich shits, and tiny women. They'll kneel to anyone with an army, or gold, or special blood. Nobody can tell me if it's more red, or less red, or what. Maybe it's purple. If the Dragon Queen wants a bunch of needles to be stumping along after her, she can have them. My people have had enough. The dead are gone from the north, but the south is full of them. You just can't tell the difference. The coin of Ares, the second of his name, had landed on madness. But half the coins of the Targaryens had landed, so. Yet only Ares would be known as the Mad King, thanks in no small part to the defiance of Duskendale. Duskendale was the greatest port on Blackwater Bay until Aegon built King's Landing. As the capital grew richer and more prosperous, it sucked ships and gold away from Duskendale. To halt its long decline, the Lord of Duskendale, Sir Dennis Darkling, petitioned King Aerys for a royal charter that would allow him to levy his own port fees and taxes, which would obviously be lower than in King's Landing. The hand of the king, Tywin Lannister, refused. But knowing of the tension between them and his king, Sir Dennis invited the king to Duskendale to evaluate his petition himself rather than referring to his hand. When Tywin admonished the king to refuse, as any sensible advisor would, a petulant and bristling Ares instead accepted, traveling to Duskendale with a small retinue and only one of his king's guard. As soon as Ares stepped within the city, Sir Dennis seized him, killing the King's Guard and the few others who dared to defend their king. Ares was hauled to the dungeons to have his beard pulled and have other petty cruelties inflicted on his royal person. Lord Tywin immediately raised an army and marched on Duskendale, but Sir Dennis threatened to kill the king at the first signs of an assault. If Sir Dennis hoped to force Tywin to offer terms, he didn't know Lord Tywin, who refused to even parley until Sir Dennis released the king and surrendered. The royal army surrounded the city, and the royal navy blockaded it. Sir Dennis had clearly not anticipated such obstinacy, nor that the king's hand would be in no rush to save the maddening king, when, as Lord Tywin himself pointed out, the realm had a better option in the king's much more stable son. Yeah. After six Imagine months, how what I would have been. Tywin's patience was at an end. Or at least none could claim he acted recklessly if he now Listen, I don't know if I don't know if y'all got it uh what's the word patent uh, when it comes to Marvel, but Imagine a little like what if series, but with Game of Thrones. Now I feel like I feel like the first the the, the the first time someone does that they'll kind of be like I mean Marvel kind of did it but they won't really say anything. After the after the second and third they're going to be like okay bro. Hey, we we did it first. Yeah, we know, but we we want to see it here. 
I used to be killing those what if and theory videos when it came to like anything I was that I uh that I was interested in Star Wars, fucking Harry Potter, uh Marvel. I try to look up what ifs or I can't look up theories because it's going to be basically books and I haven't really, I haven't, not really, I haven't read the books uh, yet. And then, what if there's literally only one channel that pops up and I'm like, can I get the variety, uh, like a variety, variety, can I get a variety pack please? Stormed the city and Sir Dennis killed the king, but the dutiful and honorable Sir Barristan the Bold volunteered to infiltrate the city and rescue his king single-handedly as befit his king's god oath. Tyler could refuse such valor publicly and so begrudged Sebastian one night. Then he would storm the city and put every man, woman, and child